It's really a pleasure for me to introduce this year's speak, the, or today's speaker, uh, Dr. Ben Humphreys from Washington University in St. Louis. Ben is also here as the, to give the 2018 COCO lecture, and we're delighted that Dr. COCO is sitting here in the third row, and he's been able to be present as well. Ben has had really an incredible career. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College. He then got his MD PhD degrees at Case Western before returning to Boston where he did his internal medicine and nephrology training uh, and then stayed on the faculty at the Brigham, rose through the ranks, and three years ago he got lured away to WashU where he's now the division director at Washington University. He's got uh, an incredible array of grants. Uh, I lost track trying to count them all, but he's very well funded, many publications. And in his spare time, he serves on an NIH study section. He's the current program chair for the uh, 2018 ASN meeting. And he just recently was elected to be the secretary treasurer of the ASCI. So I don't know when you sleep in, but it certainly sounds like you're plenty busy. Uh, he's going to give two lectures today, the one you're about to hear, and then at 5 o'clock he'll give the COCO lecture over in the School of Medicine, and of course you're all welcome to attend that lecture as well. So before I use up all of Ben's time, Ben, we're delighted to have you come to Emory, and we're looking forward to the first of your two lectures. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sands, for that kind invitation, Dr. Stevens for the invitation to be here, and, and uh, especially to Dr. Coco for being in the audience, which is a real uh, thrill for me. And as I um, fiddle with the AV connection, um, we, there we go, just go to the disclosure slide. There are my disclosures. Um, and I just wanna bring you back a little bit. This will be a little bit of a, sort of more of a storytelling um, talk than a data-driven one, but uh, this was the first dialysis machine. Um, some of you in the audience obviously are familiar with it. Uh, Will, it was invented by Willem Kolff in the early 1940s, and it consists of this drum on a spindle around which basically sausage casing is wound and rests in a bath of saline under which the uh, bottom portion of that sausage casing is submerged in water. One end of the sausage casing is hooked up to the patient's arm. It takes two pints of blood to prime the system and the blood then pools at the bottom of the sausage casing in the saline, and as a Model T engine rotates this drum right here, is moved across by an Archimedes screw principle as it becomes essentially uh, dialyzed. Now the first 18 or so patients to be treated on this contraption by Dr. Kolf died, uh, but the 19th, was a woman in a uremic coma uh, who he dialyzed for eight hours. And at the eighth hour, he thought he, maybe her color was improving. And so he leaned over and, and said, can you hear me? And she opened her eyes right up and exclaimed, I'm going to divorce my husband. <laughs> okay, which she did. And she lived another seven years, and this was the first patient to be successfully uh, dialyzed. These days, our dialysis machines look a lot different, but the overall principle is actually fairly similar. And they're shrunken down into this little cartridge over here. You can see my pointer. Um, <clears throat> and I want to point out, this is Betty, and she was a dialysis patient in our unit uh, at Washington University, right on our first floor. Um, for 30 years, and we called her the queen. She uh, was the queen of the unit. She knew everybody, every patient, every staff member, every faculty member, because actually she had been there longer than everybody. And she did very well. She only just sadly passed away in, in February. And I show this because some people do extremely well on dialysis. It's a life-saving procedure, uh, but the vast majority, and that's a real understatement, don't make it 30 years. So she's, you know, maybe one in 500,000, one in a million. I mean, so many um, uh, orders of magnitude outside of the norm. And so we're happy about dialysis, but really we would like to do better and have more therapeutic options. And so 
I want to um, describe uh, patients, uh, you know, some of our modalities of uh, treatment before patients get on dialysis with this vignette, a patient of mine actually, uh, who is a 22-year-old, she's 23 now, nursing student who was referred for a second opinion. She uh, was found to have proteinuria on a uh, life insurance screening and was referred, ultimately had a biopsy, and was uh, diagnosed with focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis with a creatinine of 1.7. She had hypertension, four grams of proteinuria. She was put, placed on an ACE inhibitor and um, uh, and in February of last year had an exacerbation, creatinine up to 2.5, proteinuria up to eight grams. And so I started on what is still standard therapy, prednisone 60 uh, milligrams every day, and her disease stabilized moderately, moderately but she gained 35 pounds, and she was going to be um, the maid of honor in a wedding. Uh, she had strie, emotional lability, insomnia, depression. I mean, all of the side effects that you associate with, uh, with prednisone. And at the end of her therapy, as scared as she was of uh, needing a kidney transplant or going on dialysis, she told me, uh, she vowed never to take prednisone again, even if it meant that her kidneys failed, which I really couldn't, couldn't blame her. And I just want to make the point that prednisone was first introduced in 1955. So we really need new therapeutic options uh, for these patients. Kidney transplantation, of course, is one option, which is wonderful. It is life-saving. Quality of life is better. It's actually substantially cheaper than dialysis over the long run. This is a picture of the first kidney transplant that was performed in 1954 at Brigham and Women's Hospital and for which a Nobel Prize was awarded to Joseph Murray in 1990. But again, probably all of you understand that there just simply aren't enough kidneys to go around. Uh, this is a graph on the left of, um, in green, patients who are on the waiting list uh, uh, at the end of the year, every year, and you can see it's really rising linearly. And part of the reason for this is that the number of transplants has held flat. And if anything, the number of living donor transplants, this bottom line over here on the right, is, is falling despite uh, motor voter you know, registration efforts and uh, uh, publicity campaigns and Facebook groups, et cetera. Um, uh, we simply do not have enough kidneys. And so in that context then, I wanna tell you about some basic science discoveries that were made several years ago that made a big splash. <clears throat> and these were published in um, 2014, four years ago now, and, and the two papers that were published concurrently. The first was entitled, Directing Human Embryonic Stem Cell Differentiation Towards a Renal Lineage Generates a Self-Organizing Kidney, and then Directed Differentiation of Human Pluripotent Cells to Your Bud Kidney Progenitor-like Cells. And so basically these authors took stem cells, human stem cells, and directed them into kidney-like um, organoids. And the popular press picked up on this at the time, and so these are some of the headlines. Lab-grown kidneys a step closer. That's fairly measured, I think you would agree. Transplant breakthrough, kidney grown from stem cells. Well, that's maybe a little bit less measured and more hyperbolic. Growing kidneys in the lab may end transplant wait list, okay? And finally, kidney breakthrough could end the need for donors. So let's think a little bit about this concept of hope or hype. And I hope that I've convinced you just in the introductory slides that the medical need here actually is uh, tremendous. And there is an incredible desire for hope among our patients with kidney disease. I get one or two emails a week from people all over the world actually asking if they can come to Wash U and get stem cell therapy for their kidney failure. And can they enroll themselves in a stem cell trial? Uh, there is that much desire because our options are limited. And yet medical history is sort of littered with problems of hype in terms of technological advances. And so I want to describe one such um, uh, in the end, very powerful advance in medicine 
and show you really how long it actually took and what were the building blocks knowledge wise that it took to actually translate it into the clinic and then through that lens um, think again about whether we're really growing transplantable kidneys in a dish that we can then um, end the need for donors. And so this issue of hope versus hype in, in research was illustrated I think well by a, a column that Eric Lander wrote about a year and a half ago. He's the head of the Broad Institute at, at MIT. And he had given a talk to an educated audience of um, uh, uh, oncologists and oncology reporters, the press, where he had said, I truly believe that within 30 to 40 years, we will reduce the majority of cancers into chronic diseases because we will have understood the genetic drivers of each disease and develop precision therapies for them. And after the talk, um, the lead reporter for ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, actually came up to him and, and said, um, really, do you really think it's gonna take that long? And I think even amongst the press, there's this expectation that cures are right around the corner, even in an area like cancer where actually really solid progress is being made. And so Roy Amara, who actually was a futurist, so he just thought about the future for his whole career and, and wrote about it, uh, had a, um, an opinion which I think is sort of relevant here, and that is that society tends to overestimate the effect of a new technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And I think that might be true in this particular case. And so I would just want to switch gears now and, and, and tell you the story actually of how EPO, erythropoietin recombinant EPO, which of course we uh, give in quantity to dialysis patients but is also given to cancer patients and others, um, was discovered and translated to the clinic. And you know, you can, deciding where that story actually begins is, is somewhat arbitrary, but I think, um, uh, I, I think a case can be made that it begins with Frederick Sanger, who in 1951 reports um, the first amino acid sequence of any, of any peptide, and it was of insulin. And that uh, discovery led to a Nobel Prize in 1958 for his work on the structure of proteins, especially that of insulin. Now, he's one of only four people to actually win a second Nobel, Peace Pr uh, Nobel Prize, and that was for his work on, on sequencing, not on sequencing amino acids, which is how he described and discovered the sequence of insulin, but on DNA. And he invented the dideoxy chain termination method for sequencing DNA molecules called Sanger sequencing. And this, in brief, involved a DNA polymerase and a DNA template strand that you would then sprinkle with um, A, C, T, or G that would not be able to continue along the DNA molecule and was to which was attached a fluorophore, which you could then run on a gel, and by the position on the gel, you could decide whether that was an A, C, T, or G. His Nobel came in 1980 for determination of base sequences in nucleic acids. In parallel, uh, Paul Berg and others uh, at uh, across the country, but he was at Stanford, um, published this paper, which really was seminal, and started the molecular biology revolution. And this was published in PNAS in the title, Biochemical Method for Inserting New Genetic Information into DNA of Simian Virus 40, Circular SV40 DNA Molecules Containing Lambda Phage Genes, et cetera. And the bottom line is, and, and, and it's really summarized in the first sentence of the abstract, we have developed methods for covalently joining DNA molecules to one another and have used these techniques to construct circular dimers of SV40 DNA. And so essentially this is the first description of uh, cutting and pasting DNA um, from one piece to another. And this ushered in the era of molecular biology um, and really allowed investigators now having no, knowing the um, peptide sequence for insulin, knowing the DNA sequence and coding those peptides, and now being able to cut and paste DNA to begin thinking of ways of how they could produce recombinant insulin in the lab. And so that brings us to Eugene Goldwasser. And <clears throat> Dr. Goldwasser is known as the father of EPO. He uh, uh, 
uh, was a scientist, he died uh, just about seven or eight years ago, um, who worked at the University of Chicago his whole career. When he was coming of age, it was during World War II, and the army was particularly concerned about the effects of radiation damage to soldiers and uh, the bone marrow suppression in particular that it caused. And one of uh, those, uh, um, one of the consequences, of course, is anemia. And so it, during his postdoctoral training, he became very interested in regulation of blood level. And he postulated that there was some circulating factor that could regulate one's hematocrit. But uh, he knew nothing more than, you know, he had nothing more than that hypothesis. And so when he started his first job as an, as an assistant professor, he took lab rats and basically re removed, I mean, it's, it's sort of simple, but he removed one organ at a time and asked wh which one causes anemia. Now, he had to keep the animals alive long enough to do that, but in this process, he actually postulated that the kidney was the source of this circulating uh, hormone, which he even called erythropoietin before anybody knew what it was. And he then decided, well, for the very start of my career, I'm going to isolate, he was a classically trained biochemist, I'm going to isolate erythropoietin, and that'll be the start of my year. And, and he thought it would take five years, seven years tops. Well, he didn't know what kind of a challenge he had taken on. And the challenge is really outlined here. Humans produce two to three million red blood cells per second. It's a thousand pounds of blood over your lifetime. And if you take all the EPO that is required to sustain that level of blood production and you put it in one place, this is the size of the pill that it would take. It's a baby aspirin. And so the challenge that, that Goldwasser undertook was of far greater magnitude than he appreciated because EPO is so exquisitely potent and its levels are therefore so low that biochemically purifying it turned out to be a Herculean task. He published several letters, you know, proving that the kidney was the source, and he had developed an assay to purify a fraction of blood, and actually he discovered it, it's found in urine, and he published a paper saying, oh, by the way, this EPO is found in the urine, and it's in this particular fraction after you put it through a column, et cetera. And this physician, uh, Dr. Takaji Miyaki, um, practiced on an island off of the coast of Japan where there was a very high incidence of aplastic anemia. He was familiar with uh, Dr. Goldwasser's studies and he wrote him a letter and said, I've read your work. I understand that this EPO it can be found in urine. I have many patients with aplastic anemia. Would you like their urine? And of course, Goldwasser said, for sure, that would be fantastic. And two years later, in the lobby of the Palmer House Hilton, well now it's the Palmer House Hilton, back then it was just the Palmer House Hotel, um, Dr. Miyake presented this 12 inch square package, okay, and it was wrapped in this furoshiki, which is a ceremonial special wrapping cloth, um, and it contained 2,550 liters of dried urine, no joke. And two years later, Goldwasser had put this through his you know, biochemical process and purified eight milligrams of uh, pure EPO. And it was the only source of pure EPO in the world. And this actually was crucial. And he took you know, a tiny bit of it and he injected it into um, anemic rats and showed that the hematocrit went you know, skyrocketed. So he knew what he had. Recall that Sanger had already shown a way to deduce or uh, define the amino acid sequence of insulin, and so now it would be simple to do the same for EPO and then use molecular biology and produce it. Well, <clears throat> it wasn't that simple, and sort of, it's sort of sad in a way, but um, Goldwasser uh, did submit a patent application to the University of Chicago, uh, never heard back, and you know, this was not the day, time when you know, PIs were routinely submitting for intellectual property and never followed up because they did, didn't, you know, who, you know, he basically found this letter many decades later. And it turned out if, you know, he said, you know, if I had received 1% of 1% of the, you know, profits from recombinant EPO, 
he could have had a gigantic lab funded for the rest of his career. Instead, he you know, struggled to be funded for the rest of his career. In any case, he tried to interest pharma in um, uh, dis discovering the amino acid sequence uh, with complete, with, with no, no success. And so finally, he said, well, we've just got to get this work done. And so he sent a little sample of his precious store to Caltech, where um, a group had, a, had, had made a machine to do this kind of um, sequencing of amino acids, and so it's a little bit more high throughput. And, and they, got, they got some results, and immediately the, the, one of the two postdocs in charge of the project, before even telling Goldwasser quit, took the results of that amino acid sequence and joined a new startup company in Cambridge and um, you know, became a competitor, essentially, to try and reach the finish line first. Ultimately, what happened was that that first uh, definition of the EPO had two amino acid uh, mistakes. And they didn't know that. So when he was designing degenerate oligos to try and clone the gene, they had these, these three um, uh, bases that were wrong. And so that slowed them down enough so that they didn't win, which is nice because you know, cheaters shouldn't prosper. <laughs> Ultimately, he... Um, uh, uh, did collaborate with Amgen. He got the sequence back. He collaborated with Amgen. Amgen beat this Cambridge um, biotech company because they had the corrected sequence. And in 1983, uh, filed a patent. Of course, Goldwasser wasn't on the patent. And um, very shortly thereafter, four years later, actually, um, the FDA approval came. And in 1987, the uh, New England Journal paper was published, Correction of the Anemia of End-Stage Renal Disease with Recombinant Human Erythropoietin. 1989 FDA approval, and you can see this is a figure from that paper. paper. This is a, a, a patient, a dialysis patient who is anephric, and you all won't remember this, but back then uh, our ESRD patients had to be transfused continuously because they were so anemic. And so here are all these transfusions that this patient had, and now he gets recombinant EPO, and he becomes transfusion independent and his hematocrit goes up to you know, 27. And so coming back to how long it takes then to translate fundamental discoveries into the clinic, um, what I've described to you here is a sequence that really took about 38 years. Insulin sequence was reported in 51, Donna molecular biology 72, dried urine 75, DNA sequencing 77, Caltech, uh, it's getting the amino acid sequence of EPO, Amgen cloning the gene, and finally FDA approval. And so let's circle back then to growing kidneys in a dish, and you know where are we on that timeline? And I just want to step back and, and review something that's probably familiar to, to everybody, but what is a stem cell? It's a single cell that can replicate itself uh, or differentiate into many different cell types, a pluripotent stem cell is one that can differentiate into all cell types in the organism's body. And in, um, uh, oh gosh, this was actually in about 2006, 12 years ago, uh, a remarkable discovery was reported. The Nobel has already been um, awarded for this. Uh, uh, the discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells was made. And and that's really shown in cartoon format here, and that is we can take patients' fibroblasts, or actually we can take a blood sample and isolate their B cells or a buccal swab, whatever. We just need a cell, any, any old cell from an adult, and by um, infecting them with these retroviruses encoding three, four transcription factors, uh, OCT4, SOX2, KLF, and CMYK, um, we can actually tr ch tr change them into induced pluripotent stem cells. It's really a, a, a it's a remarkable thing that nobody ever would have predicted could be possible. And so now this fibroblast is now an IP, we call it an induced pluripotent stem cell. It can become any cell in the body. If you did this on a mouse cell and inject it into a, a mouse a, a blastocyst, this cell can contribute to all lineages within the mouse. And so this was discovered by Shinya Yamanaka. Um, and um, I was actually at his talk when he described this for the first time. And it's the only time that I've been at a scientific talk, which are usually in dark rooms full of a bunch of nerds, and the interaction is, is very sedate and stuff, but it was the first time that it was like, after the talk, he was a rock star, and there, it was like five groups of people deep surrounding the podium, just peppering him with questions, not believing what they had just heard. And so he shared the Peace Prize with Sir John 
Gurdon in, um, in 2012. And so the applications of induced pluripotent stem cell biology for human health are actually incredibly promising, and um, they include differentiating them into single cell types. So imagine insulin uh, dependent di uh, diabetics, where there are now protocols to differentiate these cells into beta cells. And then people take these beta cells, they show that they respond to um, hyperglycemia with insulin secretion. If you inject them into a mouse, you cure their diabetes. Now they're it putting them into these hydrogels and injecting them under the skin of patients in an attempt to sort of normalize uh, diabetes. Similarly, in single gene um, neural diseases like Parkinson's or ALS, you can differentiate these cells into, into neurons. And I'll show you data on dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's in an attempt to then inject them back into the brain, believe it or not, and cure Parkinson's. And ultimately, Rather than single cell diseases, what we want to do is do that in multicellular organs like kidneys, but that's going to be a much bigger task, and more on that a little later. But just to sort of hopefully convince you that this is a technology with actually amazing promise, these are some studies from the lab of Lawrence Studer, who's at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he um, really focuses exclusively on human iPS cells and the goal of his lab is to develop treatments for Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's, of course, um, is a disease in which your dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra are depleted, ultimately leading to movement disorders um, and uh, de debilitation and, and, and death. And um, these, this is the brain of a monkey that was injected with iPS-derived monkey cells. It turned into dopaminergic neurons and um, injected into the brain, and then labeled with this kind of blue uh, uh, fluorescent marker. And the point here is that they're not just little circular globs sitting there, they've actually got de dendrites and axons, and, and it looks like they have um, plugged into the circuitry of the brain. But proving that they've plugged in is actually not trivial. And they did some very elegant studies to prove that, and I think it, they really did prove it. And they used a technique called optogenetics. The details are not all that important, except to say that they are able to express a protein, halorhodopsin, that's not normally present in these iPS cells, and, um, and then turn these iPS cells into dopaminergic neurons and then inject them into the brains. And the thing about halorhodopsin is when you shine a green laser, halo, the, the rhodopsin is activated and it opens a channel in the membrane of the neuron which depolarizes it. So the neuron is, is basically frozen. It's not killed, it's just depolarized, and so it cannot release any dopamine. And this is a reversible process. If you turn the laser off, the membrane repolarizes and can start secreting dopamine again. And so this is a movie of a model of Parkinson's disease in mouse where you lesion half of the dopaminergic neurons in a mouse's brain and so it shows lateralized behavior. And this is a little contraption where there's food on either side, left and right. But the mouse is ignoring the food on the left and only sniffing and sampling the food on the right. And so this is an animal that has the, the, the lesion and is, has, exhibits this lateralized exploration behavior. Right, see there's oh, the right food on the right, but he's ignoring the food on the left. And so this is now a movie of mice into whose brains these dopaminergic neurons that express halorhodopsin have been injected. And um, this is, um, excuse me, this is a control. So the control protein EYFP has been um, uh, uh, injected. So they're shining the laser, there's no halorhodopsin, the dopaminergic neurons are still firing and working. So we're not inactivating. This is the negative control, okay? And the point here is you cure the phenotype. And I know it looks kind of funny with all the green laser, but the mouse is perfectly happy. And the mouse is now sampling from the left side, the right side, uh, doesn't really matter anymore. And that's because these neurons that have been injected have successfully integrated into the brain, made proper connections, and are releasing dopamine in a way that um, cures this lateralized phenotype. Now, Skeptics in the audience might say, oh, well, we don't really know that it's from dopamine, that it may, you know, just be 
something funky about the injection and so that's where this halo rhodopsin comes in and in this case we re revert to the lateralized behavior even though we've injected these curative cells and the reason is excuse me the reason is that um, the IPS derived neurons see right 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 uh, are frozen because their, their membrane has been depolarized. And so I think this is very sort of rigorous evidence that these cells are actually functional. And so that then brings us to kidney in the last um, 10 or 15 minutes. And, um, and, and so where do we stand with these kinds of um, personalized medicine, stem cell derived uh, tissue kinds of experiments in medicine? And I think it's safe to say we're not where the folks in Parkinson's are, but um, but there has been progress made. And what, um, what has been done is actually developmental knowledge from developmental biology of how the kidney is generated um, has led to protocols that allow us to bathe these iPS cells in different combinations of cytokines and small molecules that recapitulate development so that we take these pluripotent stem cells and then we induce them to become mesendoderm and from there, intermediate mesoderm, and we know that the kidney arises during development from the intermediate mesoderm. And then if we can coax them to become these two cell types, ureteric bud and metanephric mesenchyme, these are the kidney progenitors that actually generate the kidney, and that's what they do for a living is they make nephrons, and you generate what is what has been called a self-organizing kidney in a dish. And so we do this in the lab, and this is what it looks like. You grow these stem cells, and it just looks like a kind of boring monolayer and you differentiate them and then you put them onto this trans well and it's a little tiny thing it's you know like half the size of your fingernail so this is you know there's a scale issue here but even so what um, we find is that these um, kidney organoids actually are somewhat amazing and um, uh, this is a human kidney on the left you can see on the bottom those are glomeruli there's tubules with lumen there's interstitial cells and over here on the right, this is an organoid, you can see glomeruli with tubules and a lumen and interstitium. If we look by fluorescence, we can see, in fact, and it's probably easiest to see on the very right-hand side, that these cells um, have, again, this is a podocytes in red with surrounding proximal tubule in green, and there's a lumen that's bridging off of here. And if we follow it down, it segments properly into the um, loop of Henle and the thick ascending limb and, and to the collecting duct. And so, um, I think I'm just going to skip over that. And so, one of the challenges of describing these organoids is that they're multicellular and we don't really know exactly what cells are in there to begin with. And so, it turns out that single cell RNA sequencing is a very good way of describing in an unbiased way the identity of cells in a complex tissue. And I won't go into the details, but I think you can appreciate that in this middle channel, this is a microfluidic device, and it gives you a sense of the scale. This movie here is that little tiny part right here. And the middle channel has a, um, that's a bead. That black thing is a bead that's covered with oligonucleotides, and it's sitting in lysis buffer. And over here is um, saline, and there's a cell. It's really hard to see, but it comes right there. It's really small, much smaller than the bead. It might be hard for you to see over there, but it's right there. And it becomes co-encapsulated because there's oil pinching these droplets off. So it forms a reverse emulsion. And this bead and this cell become co-encapsulated um, in a droplet, just like this right here. And because there's lysis buffer, the cell lysis, the RNA is released. It binds to oligo-DT through the poly A tail on each mRNA molecule. And there's a unique DNA barcode on the bead, which then allows us to do a reverse transcription and create a cDNA library and sequence it and ultimately determine the genes that were specific in that one cell. And so this is actually generates a data set which is a little bit hard for human brains to comprehend because it's so rich because we're generating thousands of cells and each cell has thousands of different gene expression levels. And so how do we make sense of this? And so one of the ways we do this is through machine learning. And I just want to give you an example of machine learning um, uh, of, of high dimensional data points and how machine learning can help um, make sense of them by thinking about people, not cells, but people. And think of all the different ways that you can describe two different people. For example, I work at Wash U. That's my date of birth. That's my profession, my eye color, etc. Here's someone else. 
who works at a restaurant, different birth date, different profession, different eyes. Each variable here in this case is represented by a vector of differing length, which um, helps quantitate this particular variable. Now instead of thinking of people, think of cells. And instead of eye color and profession, think of gene expression for one particular gene. And so now this data point right here consists of uh, many different vectors which can be converted into a number. Each um, of those numbers is associated with that one cell. And we've got about 5,000 or 10,000 different cells with all of these vectors. And what machine learning does is in an unsupervised way, it compares this one cell to all 4,999 other cells across all 2,000 vectors. And so computationally, it's very intense, but computers are good at computation. And then what it can do is say, oh, I've found some other cells that are very similar along those 2,000 variables, so I'm going to put you guys together in a cluster. And then I found others that are actually very different. And so you can reduce the complexity of this single cell data set now into just a 2D graph, which is shown here, in which in which case each dot represents a single cell. And the closer two dots are together in, in this graph, the more similar they are. In fact, cells of the same type are the same color. And this is all unsupervised. We haven't told the computer what cell types are there. It's telling us what cell types. And in this way, when we go and look at this gene expression profile of these clusters, we can see, oh, we've got a bunch of podocytes here. Those are glomerular cells. We've got proximal tubule cells. We have, these are actually mesenchymal, these are fibroblasts. Here's some endothelial cells. And then, whoa, what is this muscle? Why do we have muscle in the kidney? We shouldn't have muscle. And these are actually all neurons. We shouldn't have neuronal cell bodies in the kidney either. So what this experiment told us was, actually, we have off-target cell types that we don't want and that we need to get rid of if we're going to ever be able to use this for transplantation. We can then ask the computer to order these cells across pseudotime, which just means it's placing cells next to each other that are similar. And as they make um, fate choices, we can say, oh, what transcription factors are expressed here versus here? And that helps us to tune our differentiation protocol. And so finally, the idea then would be that we can take fibroblasts from a patient, grow these organoids, and use them for disease modeling or drug testing, biobanking, targeted gene editing, and so on. Someday, maybe, transplantation, but there are a number of problems, and I haven't even outlined most of them, but uh, it turns out the cell types in these organoids are immature. They're equivalent to about a sort of third trimester kidney. They're nowhere near what they would need to be to be functional as an adult kidney. They've got these neurons and muscles, which obviously we don't have those in normal human kidneys. We need to get rid of those. They have no vascularization. There's no, uh, no blood flow. Uh, through these organoids, and how are you going to generate a filtrate if you've got no blood flow? And they don't form a ureter. They form these collecting ducts, but they don't end in a ureter. So even if you could get blood flow and generate urine, where's it going to go? It's actually just going to form a cyst. So when people have transplanted these into mice, they form. Sometimes it'll it'll um, vascularize and generate what seems like urine, but then it just forms a cyst, which kind of um, gets big, and then the organoid uh, gets obstructed. So it's safe to say that the road ahead for iPS-derived kidney organoids will be a long one. I just want to finish with uh, what may end up being a much shorter pathway to growing transplantable kidneys. And this is in pigs. And uh, believe it or not, um, sort of amazing progress has been made in this particular area. And I'll describe two different strategies that are being undertaken. And, the rationale here is a simple one. Pig kidneys are just about the size of adult kidneys. That's it. So it seems like you know it's a good match. And so in this first uh, strategy called blastocyst complementation, what uh, investigators are able to do is um, take uh, pig blastocysts, so fertilized embryo, but that contains a gene, PDX1, which is required for generation of the pancreas. When you lack PDX1, you generate an embryo with literally no pancreas because you need that gene. And so into that blastocyst with PDX1 deletion, you inject stem cells from, in this case, a mouse that are labeled orange. And because the PDX1 has 
made the generation of a pancreas impossible, you have cleared out a niche for these cells to then differentiate into pancreas and not be outcompeted by the pig cells. And in fact, this is what they show, is they can uh, find a mouse pancreas from this pig embryo. And so the idea basically is, is shown here. We take a uh, pig blastocyst fertilized egg, we genetically modify it to inhibit pancreas information, obviously insert kidney there, inject human IPS cells or mouse, and get a human pancreas out of it. And so this has been done, it's sort of been shown as proof in principle. It turns out when you try and do this in kidneys, it's a lot tougher than one would think. So um, I wanna um, outline a, a second and, and final um, uh, strategy that is now being used, and that's uh, it's also xenotransplantation. And it turns out this is not really a new field. Um, in 1996, Pfizer made a $1 billion investment. They started a whole division that was um, dedicated to studying pig xenotransplantation. And they pulled the plug about five or six years later. They had two major problems. One, one big problem and one total deal breaker. The big problem was rejection. It turns out pigs have this sugar moiety, which human um, immune systems recognize as almost like anaphylactic uh, uh, rejection, immediate rejection. Um, but the bigger concern came from the FDA, and it turns out that pig DNA has uh, porcine endogenous retroviruses. These are viruses that are encoded in the genomic DNA of the pig. They're not just floating around in the pig blood. They're in every cell's genome. And the concern of the FDA was that if we transplant this organ, and let's say we figure out rejection and that's no big deal, how do we know these retroviruses aren't gonna reactivate in that transplanted human and you know who knows what would happen? And so the FDA basically said, this is a hard stop. We will never ever um, uh, approve these organs because of the worry about endogenous retrovirus reactivation. And so the field died for uh, 15 years, and then George Church's group at Harvard published this paper about two years ago, Genome-Wide Inactivation of por Porcine Endogenous Retroviruses, or PERVs. And essentially what they did was take CRISPR-Cas9 technology, and this is a, a method of gene editing, uh, the, the genome, and they eliminated all 62 endogenous retroviruses. And cloned pigs. They now have cloned pigs that can mate and reproduce. They have a whole colony of them with no retroviruses. And so now it's a green light again. And the field is back open. And so we can think about cornea, we can think about lung, kidney, heart, liver, pancreas, you know, you name it. Uh, this is what, what folks uh, uh, are, are now attempting in the field of xenotransplantation. And in fact, uh, there are biotech companies that have been started. So eGenesis is one that George Church himself started. Uh, they describe themselves as a life sciences company whose mission is to transform xenotransplantation into an everyday life-saving medical procedure. And here's synthetic genomics, harnessing the power of nature to transform products, yada, yada. And, um, and so here, here's the paper um, from August 10th, 2017, where they really showed proof of principle that not only could they do this in cells, but they could generate a colony of pigs that, um, uh, that have their retroviral DNA inactivated. And so once again, of course, the press goes crazy. Gene editing spurs hope for transplanting pig organs into humans. Scientists hit breakthrough in quest to transplant pig organs. Scientists are getting closer to using pig organs for human transplants. CRISPR bacon, pigs could soon <laughs> save millions more lives. I mean, I could go on, but I mean, the puns only get worse. Um, so uh, the University of Maryland recently announced, this is just last November, a $24 million um, investment from United Therapeutics to help, uh, help them in manufacturing human organs through xenotransplantation. So this is the real deal. This is not just a couple academics publishing papers. Uh, what are the obstacles? Well, it turns out that rejection is not limited to alpha-gal, this sugar moiety. Now, um, you can imagine that it's, for alpha-gal, all you have to do is CRISPR-Cas9 and delete the, the alpha-gal, and you sort of solve that problem. But, but it turns out there are minor antigens, just as, you know, 
anyone in transplantation wouldn't be surprised by that. And so immunosuppression is still required, um, but, the, uh, uh, so, but, but to date, uh, pig kidney graft survival um, has reached 136 days in a baboon, um, supporting, and that was an anephric baboon, um, and they used ATG with anti-CD20 induction and anti-CD40, RAPA, and corticosteroids for maintenance, so sort of very similar protocols to what we use in our kidney uh, transplant patients. And this is actually just from this past February, uh, Time Magazine, Why Pig Organs Could Be the Future of Transplants, and Church is quoted in this article saying that he anticipates that pig-to-human organ transplant clinical trials could happen in as little as two years. Now, is this hype or is this appropriate hope? I mean, I'm not sure. Two years seems very aggressive to me, but uh, there is no doubt that between blastocyst complementation and xenotransplantation of genetically engineered pigs, the pig strategy is much closer to being in humans. And so in conclusion, uh, lab-grown kidneys do have the potential, IPS-derived kidneys do have the potential for transformative impact, but clearly this is over the long term. And all of those headlines were clearly hype. And I do think there is hope in particular for disease modeling, toxicity testing, and screening with kidney uh, organoids. But in terms of growing kidney transplants for the clinic, we are many, many decades away from that reality. Uh, on the other hand, xenotransplantation has leapfrogged the entire field in the space of three years, and so who knows where we'll be in another three years. So is there hope for sure? Uh, is there hype? Uh, definitely. And I think the important thing is not overselling as physicians and particularly as academics. The important thing is not overselling our promises and eroding the trust of our patients when we don't follow through. So uh, I want to thank you. Uh, for your attention. This is uh, my lab that has done some of the work that I showed here today, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Ben, thank you for a remarkable talk, both entertaining and enlightening all at the same time. Uh, I was thinking about the data you showed where they injected the IPS into the brain and got what looked like neurons to develop. If you were to have a patient like the one you showed in your talk uh, early on in the course where, say, they have podocyte loss but haven't had destruction of the rest of the kidney, could you potentially put IPS cells in that differentiate into podocytes and help replace that population before the rest of the kidney is destroyed? Well, that's a, that's a good question, and clearly, given the success in these single-cell diseases, is there an equivalent single-cell disease in kidney is, I think, what you're asking. And for sure, there are a number of podocytopathies of sort of genetically driven causes of focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis and, and others, which, uh, for which strong evidence indicates that it's a single-cell podocyte disease driving kidney failure. Uh, so it, it fits the bill, if you will, as a single-cell kidney disease. The challenge is when you envision the glomerulus and the uh, filtration through the glomerulus, the glomerular capillary is lined by endo endothelial cells, fenestrated endothelial cells, and is separated from podocytes by the glomerular basement membrane. And so when you have podocyte loss and shedding into the urine, which, as you know, does happen and we can measure it, it's not clear how we are going to successfully deliver podocytes to the other side of the capillary basement membrane. It turns out, uh, unlike leukocytes, podocytes don't have that ability to degrade basement membrane and go take up residence on the other side of the bloodstream. So I think theoretically, yes, we can generate, actually we can already generate podocytes from IPS cells. We have a single cell disease, but we don't have a good way of delivering them through the bloodstream. Question. Okay, so I have a follow-up. Please question. use the microphone. Um, 
That was a great talk. Thank you very much. A follow-up to Jeff's question about regenerative capacity of the kidney in, in general. Um, are there, in many organs, as you know, there are, there are pluripotential stem cells that can be or are thought to be stimulated. Is that true in the kidney, and is that an approach, at least for early uh, kidney disease? Well, that, that's been the, the question of whether kidney contains a stem cell population the way that, for example, bone marrow or intestine clearly do uh, has been a controversial one for the last 15 years and one that I've been involved with. What is clear is, and we've all taken care of patients with ATN, uh, maybe sepsis in the ICU, who become dialysis dependent and they're pressor dependent, who then get antibiotics, the infection is cleared, and uh, uh, begin making urine, but are not, you know, clearing, and but then come off pressors, come off dialysis, and 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 you know their creatinine may not be what it used to be, but their functional capacity returns, uh, and this reflects uh, the repair process in the kidney, and so clearly the kidney has a robust repair capacity, but there's really, and this is now me speaking, uh, not everybody in my field would agree, but there's really no solid evidence that that repair is accomplished by a dedicated stem cell population. Rather, it appears to be more similar to what can occur in the heart uh, and to a certain degree in the liver, and that is replenishment of nephron epithelia through a process of dedifferentiation. So injury-induced dedifferentiation, re-entry into the cell cycle, proliferation of this kind of precursor progenitor-like cell, and then redifferentiation into uh, epithelial cell that is ter not, not terminally differentiated, but differentiated and, and functions in that segment as a cell normally would. And the key difference here is that what we believe is that every cell in the nephron has that capacity to dedifferentiate, redifferentiate, and proliferate. It's not a specified subset. Um, and so uh, stem cells, by definition, are a small subset of groups that give rise to the rest of the cells that cl clearly is not the case, or at least in my opinion, the evidence doesn't suggest that it's the case in the nephron. Other questions? If not, I'll ask what may be a very simple-minded question, but in one of your slides where you show the IPS cell moving along and eventually you get the two types of uh, progenitors that ultimately merge to make a kidney, in my simple-minded memory of development, you always picture them as coming from opposite ends of the body as opposed to splitting. Is there anything about, is there some sort of physical interaction that requires the ureteric bud to actually grow into it that ultimately gives you the collecting duct and ureter, or is that just pictures in a textbook? No, no, I think you're right, and I sort of oversimplified some of the obstacles that we face. In fact, w when we do the single cell sequencing, what we find is that the, the way that the, the, these or kidney organoids were described originally as a uh, self-organizing kidney through um, coalescence of the metanephric mesenchyme and the ureteric bud uh, actually probably was wrong. So we don't find any ureteric bud. And so it's sort of amazing that we get the nephrons that we do, but we really think it's only the metanephric mesenchyme derived part of the nephron. And so in, in fact, we, we really can't find good evidence for any collecting duct at all. And so that's one of the challenges right now is how do we get that collecting duct so that we can generate a, a ureter, uh, uh, a ureter like tissue. Um, so yeah, that's just yet another challenge for the next few decades. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank Ben for a tremendous talk. Uh, we look forward to your 5 o'clock talk, the COCO Lecture, and we invite everybody to join us then if their schedule so permits.